Hi, everybody. I feel like we can turn this event into Chinese language, almost, looking from the names. In any event, we, we will proceed with, with English since we did do the marketing in English. Um, welcome back, or welcome for the first time joining Wild China's uh, book club event. Zhang Mei. My name is uh, Zhang Mei, founder of Wild China, and we launched Wild China virtual events first in 2020. And today it is officially our 100th event. So oh, wow. very honored to have you, Weika, and very honored to have everybody joining us again. And um, for this month's book club, we read Joan is OK. And here I have a copy of the book. And as you can see, yeah. Wonderful. It's a bright color. You can't miss it. It is. It is. Right. And um, today, as you can see, the other, uh, the beautiful lady there is Wei Kalan, the author of the book. Honor to have you. Welcome. Likewise. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, start by introducing Wei Kalan. Wei Kalan is the author of two books. Chemistry and Joan is OK. Her work has appeared in many notable publications, including the esteemed The New Yorker, which I read on a weekly basis and feel guilty if I don't finish. And she has received numerous awards, including the 2018 Penn Hemingway, a Whiting Award, and a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35, as well as being in the 2019 Best American Short Stories and O. Henry Prices. Waco has a Master's of Arts, of Fine Arts from Boston University, as well as a Bachelor in, surprisingly, Chemistry uh -huh. and a Doctorate in epide ep Epidemiology yeah. from Harvard. Yeah. She currently lives in New York, New York City and teaches at the University of Pennsylvania, Barnard and uh, Columbia. Now the book we're discussing today, Joan is OK, is, is a piece of fiction. It has this very, I would say, a very dry humor that sometimes makes you giggle and then in the next second hits you with this powerful force that is so profound and moving. I, I couldn't put it down. I was reading this I got this book in January, February, and knowing that the, the book talk was way later, but I finished it way earlier, that I had to take notes. <laughs> um, anyway, the Chinese immigrant to America story has been told beautifully you know, by so many previous you know, women before Wake Up. There was uh, June Chan's Wild Swan, and of course, Amy Tan's uh, Joy Luck Club. And I really think, Weika, your Joan is OK is, is right up there with mm -hmm. those books. But telling a very different story, telling the story of a very different generation, well off, very cool, um, <laughs> <laughs> different from, uh, you know, before. So and this generation I see all around me now, currently, they're the ones working in Silicon Valley, Google, Apple, Goldman Sachs and McKinsey, et cetera. Right. So I'll, I'll let Weka talk more um, about this. Uh, just one last bit on logistics. So Weka will give us a talk on how and why she wrote the book, probably. And then I will lead off with a couple of questions. If anyone has questions, please um, feel free to put it in the chat box. We'll try to get through them as quickly as we can. And with that, Weka, off to you. Thank you for taking the time. Of course. Um, thank you so much, May. Um, it's wonderful to, to be here and talk to, you know, your readers. Um, and when I got this opportunity, I was like, I have to do it because, you know, thinking about traveling to China has um, just been on my mind ever since. Um, so I had written this book um, pre the pandemic. Um, so I turned in a draft of this book, March of 2020, which was the time when the pandemic was really coming to a head in America. Mm -hmm. And so like we were going under lockdown, there's no pandemic in the first draft of this book. Um, and then I had to readjust with my editor and fit the pandemic into this book um, because yeah, it's kind of a surprise. Um, I, ha I had no intention of writing Joan, who's an ICU doctor in America, Asian American doctor in America, 
um, I had no intention of incorporating the pandemic in there. And somehow it had to be incorporated later on because of, you know, the, the, the just, it was just hard to predict at that time. Um, and I think I couldn't not talk about it. So I had to incorporate mm. it in. At the time, um, I think I was drawing predominantly from an experience that I was having. Um, so I was born in Nanjing. And at that time, my grandmother was visiting from Nanjing for like two months um, with my parents in Detroit. And um, she just got stranded here for like 10 months like she was very very unhappy she really wanted to go back to China they weren't really letting citizens in it was sort of like the 5-1 policy flights were always getting canceled um, her visa expired um, so she finally made it back um, she was supposed to leave in March but she went back finally in September of that year <laughs> uh, and it was really wonderful to have her here but I also couldn't visit her because America was also shut down so um, I, I think I was thinking about that because I don't think I will see my grandmother in the States again. I don't think my mother will see her mother in the States ever again. Um, and I don't know when is the next time I'm going to be able to see her given sort of travel restrictions. And, it, it, and I think a lot of that sadness and just emotion went into the book in creating parts of the book that were pandemic driven for the family. Um, I didn't think I could write a book without the pandemic after I thought about it. And that was kind of incorporated into that. Another reason, one of the earliest reasons I wrote this book is my first book was about a chemist. Um, I think in some ways, I don't want to say overrepresented, but Asians are very well represented in the fields of basic science research. Um, oftentimes, um, the Asian scientist is the worker. They do all the work that the PI wants you to do. And so that was kind of the, the, the basis of chemistry of this like somewhat very unhappy but disillusioned person who still really loves science. And I, I love science. Like I, I came from such a heavy science background that um, I still really love science. And it's just hard to kind of think about, you know, um, having gone through that. And that was kind of the forefront of chemistry. When I came to Joan, one of the reasons I wanted to write Joan is that um, I was a maid of honor in a, a bridesmaid party with six other doctors, including the <laughs> bride. And they were all Asian and they're Asian American doctors, <laughs> all from Harvard. So you can imagine oh. how like crazy that bridesmaids party was and how organized it was. We were so organized. Everything was very accounted for. Um, and I really admired these women and I really admired their work ethic and I really admired, they came from the generation of immigrants, as you said, who really struggled a lot, right? In terms of building the world, building a safety net for their children. Um, but they were also under a lot of pressure to kind of perform in this like very meritocracy driven world. Um, and they're all women in medicine. And I think if you do studies like women, across the board underperform compared to men supposedly, but Asian women for some reason never do, right? Like they're <laughs> always kind of overperforming compared to any sort of class. Um, and I really wanted to capture this, this like just working woman who's just in this field, she just wants to do her job and she's very frustrated that she's not able to do her job because that's what she's trained to do. She's trained to work. She's trained to like show up for her job and be a very responsible citizen. Um, so I was very motivated by that. Um, and when I wrote the first novel, I was really interested in thinking about the model minority um, framework. And, you know, oftentimes when I was growing up, I was told the model minority is this myth. And to be honest, I went to Harvard. I don't necessarily think it's a myth if I'm like, in, you know, if I'm symbolic of it and if, if I represent it in many ways. Um, and so I wanted to think about that model minority quote unquote myth and really interrogate that and think about, you know, what this means for a character mm -hmm. like this. Um, so I knew that was the character I was trying to create. And just for like the, the readers here, um, one of the books that I was very inspired by growing up was um, Camus the Stranger. And the Stranger is a book. Um, mm -hmm. Marceau is a character at the beginning who, the, his mother dies and he, by the end of the book, I'm gonna ruin this book for you, but it is a hundred years old, so it's okay. Um, by the end of the book, he is on trial for the murder of his, or for the death of his mother because he doesn't grieve properly. He doesn't, um, he doesn't, he's not as sad 
as he, he should be. And I thought, why did I connect with this book so much? I connected it, with it so much because oftentimes Asian people in America are often seen as very um, robotic, emotionless. We just work. We don't know how to express ourselves. I don't know how many times in interviews I was coached, Waiki, you have to be personable. You have to show personality. You have to be extroverted. Otherwise, they're going to think that you're just like a boring person, Asian girl who can just do math. You know, I don't know how many times I was taught this, that I have to like put the energy forward or something. So I think that was one of the reasons I was so drawn to the stranger because he was essentially, this white man was essentially condemned for a lack of emotion. And I thought what better protagonist for a book to mimic that, but an Asian woman trying to just work but being condemned for her emotion, her lack of emotions for the death of her father, which is the start of the book. Um, and so that was kind of the idea of the book and it went further. And then when I, the pandemic came in, um, I folded it in with the parents, but also, you know, um, it's interesting. Um, I'm of the generation where medicine was like the safe path, right? Like you, if you can do medicine, you should go into medicine. Um, I think a lot of people, have always asked me questions like, Waiki, you're so good at science. Why didn't you just go into science? You know, um, so I think the sense of if you can do science, you should do it. And um, during the pandemic, this was the first time I saw some of my friends really question whether they should have been in medicine because there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment about COVID, like COVID was from China. So the sense of there's this disease from China causing problems. Yeah. And Chinese people have been blamed for a lot of issues. They were banned from this country for 60 years, et cetera, et cetera. We've had a lot of problems with exclusion and sort of everything that's Chinese is gross, right? Like in growing up in this country, Chinese food is gross. It's too salty. MSG is bad for you, you know? Um, um, and so I think that really played into that stereotype. And I think I have some friends really just wonder, why am I helping people who are dying of this disease when I'm being blamed on national television for this disease, you know, when that's the public mm -hmm. sentiment. And I think that was the first time they really kind of thought about something identity oriented that was hard mm -hmm. for them to process. Um, and so I wrote this book mainly because oftentimes science is considered objective and I don't think so. I think science has been very heavily politicized um, and thought about as sort of like a public entity. Um, and so that's kind of my spiel about Joe. I'm sorry if that was like a little bit over. <laughs> hmm. It's 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 very interesting. Like, um, it, it surprised me that the pandemic was added in later, yeah. and also your exploration of identity, sort of a sense of belonging, um, could could be a surprise. I I read your book actually right around the. Um, Olympic time. So there was the Eileen Gu, you know, whether she's Chinese or she's American. So the, oh, the discussion of identity and, and it was like in the middle of it. So I thought those were your starting point for writing yeah. the book. So very interesting. Um, well, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have a very urgent, but not serious question. What's the name of your dog? My dog? Uh, my dog's name is Biscuit. <laughs> what is it? His name is Biscuit. Biscuit. Okay. Because I was on your website and I'm like, she should tell us the name of the dog. <laughs> okay. Uh, now we can move on. I, um, <laughs> do, you, do you have pets, mate? Do you have a dog? I do. We have a dog. And that's why I'm like immediately, like when you. I, I love dogs. What kind of dog do you, you have to tell me what kind of dog you have now? Nab. Oh, wow. My little daughter, the youngest one, picked it. Um, but you know, um, Sir David Tang, yeah. the, 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 the gentleman from Hong Kong, yeah. uh, I heard he said a line, which I thought was very true, because I was never a dog lover. Like a lot of China, my dad, all the people, everyone in my Chinese family never liked pets, never liked dogs. You know, we barely could feed ourselves, not to mention dogs. And David Tan said one thing, said, if you fall in love with one dog, you'll fall in love with all the dogs. Yeah, it's true. Right? My family were not dog people. My dad, he kind of grew up in the countryside. And then, you know, I think yeah. if you grew up in China, you're not necessarily dog. So I didn't have a dog my whole life. And 
Biscuit was my first dog. I got him when I was 24, 25. So it was my first pet, you know? Oh, um, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, she's adorable. Him? Yeah. <laughs> him or her, actually? Him, him. Him, yeah. Um, I okay. think I'll do a girl dog next time. I think boy dogs right. are a little crazy. <laughs> Okay. All right. Now moving on to some of the paragraphs of the book. Sure. I, I will start with the, the word trunk. I, I would imagine, let me see if looking at our attendance, probably most people can see. Okay. Those two. Oh, okay. Thank Wonderful. you, Kendra. That's very helpful. And um, you talked about this word three times yes. in the book, yes. right? In the very beginning, uh, that was the last word Joan said to her father. And uh, I often would confuse you with Joan. Somehow when I was reading the book, I would think of you as Joan. So sometimes I would say you, okay? <laughs> You'd have to understand that's where I was coming from. Yeah, and and then, then you explained these two different versions of chuang versus chuang in, on page 95 and 197. Would you mind reading us those two paragraphs and, and tell... Sure. Tell me, I'm curious in two areas. One is, um, how did you decide to use this character or the sound as such an important sort of character to yeah. shape your dad? Yeah. And secondly, is how did you decide the placement of these three times, which was interesting. Yeah. You know, the placement, how they show up in the book. Yeah, so Chuang and Chuang. So Chuang, Chuang Zhao, and then Chuang, like you're gonna like push forward. Um, so I think I, I, I choose, chose these two words because, well, it's a little bit of just personal experience. Like when you when you immigrate, my dad was always like, you know, Waiki, you gotta, you gotta like compete, you gotta Chuang, you gotta blah, 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 blah. My dad had such an accent that sometimes it was really hard to tell what he was trying to say, right? So. Um, I think in my mind, I was thinking the ways that Chinese characters could sort of kind of change and could sort of kind of be different in a mind. So in the book, you know, she's thinking about, wait, did my father mean the first character? Or did my father mean the second character? Um, and her father's gone, so she can't ask him anymore. So she's sort of one of these in between areas where she's like, I don't really know what he was trying to tell me. And that was mm -hmm. sort of a sense mm -hmm. of kind of loss, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll read the two paragraphs that you mentioned for these two words. <laughs> so for Tsuang, the, the, the paragraph goes, to write a Chinese word, we sometimes do it in halves. On the left-hand side, we can put a person on top of an ocean wave. And on the right-hand side, give this wave riding person a knife. A knife for fighting with, for striving with, a knife to accompany you on the unknown sea adventure ahead. Yeah. Tuan, to create something that never was, to forge a new path, to innovate, to achieve, to strive, anything worth doing requires a person to talk. So that was that first character. Yeah. Um, do you want me to read the second one? I can do that. Yes, please. Okay, great. So this comes a little bit later and she's wondering maybe her dad meant Tuang. The other Tuang is third tone, not fourth. For this Tuang, we put a horse inside a door such that the character itself refers to breaking down barriers and charging through. I was reminded of the Trojan horse, the surprise gift horse outside, but also of horse power, which now belonged to cars. A green Mustang might be irrefutably American muscle, but so was the driver inside. He was pure American muscle with a Chinese heart. Goodbye, doctor, daughter, goodbye, but also see you again. Um, so in that moment, I think, you know, I'm interested in Chinese characters because they, um, they're, I think for Chinese audiences, this is very obvious, but it's, 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 um, in, you know, in, in English speaking books, in English books, oftentimes Spanish or French or Latin or Greek, they're just written into the text and you're almost mm -hmm. expected to understand what they mean mm -hmm. because English is a romance Germanic language with an alphabet. Chinese is almost never written into text because I think no one, if you didn't have the pinyin, would understand what that word means, right? Mm. And I'm interested in maybe making the Chinese language a little bit more accessible to people. 
um, because I think it's a very beautiful language. Um, and I think there's a lot of stories in that. And I think sometimes it's lost because oftentimes Chinese is written as pinging and not the actual characters. Mm -hmm. But no one, no, no American would understand the character if you just wrote it, right? So yeah. that was kind of my idea of incorporating those two mm -hmm. words. Yeah, well, I, I personally really liked the way you used these two words, two characters, and because largely they really show the character of your dad. I mean, your, see, yeah. I told you yeah. earlier. No, okay. I, okay. you. I get it, I get it, yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, on that, um, the next uh, interesting thing is you also shaped Joan's brother, Fang, mm -hmm. and the sister-in-law. Um, they, they really represented the kind of new Chinese immigrants that we were talking about that really belong to the Southampton and the Greenwich <laughs> Village or those who live in Shanghai and may have another house in Atherton. Um, I think you're the first person to really write about them and um, you know bring them to to life. Right. Also, also the kind of struggles like the mother and the father have. Mm -hmm. um, both the uh, just by the way, I'm exactly drinking steaming hot water. By now, it's no longer <laughs> steaming. Right. So, which is very much, uh, well, you know, you know, may I have hot water too. I have like, I always have hot water. <laughs> so one of my thing about identity is, do you judge by the fact that we all drink hot water or by the passport oh, that you God. hold? It's so hard. Um, I think, um, you know, I would never say that I'm Chinese, Chinese, right? I think um, I study the language. I try to be better at Chinese. Um, I always text my mother in Chinese. Um, I always, you know, we chat with my cousins in Chinese, but I am not Chinese because I, my, my Chinese is stuck in 1995, right? <laughs> um, I'm not modern. Um, so, so, you know, um, but there's a lot of habits that I know, like the hot water, kind of like certain yeah. behavioral things, right? Um, mm -hmm. That I just find very comforting. I think it's just, it just feels like home. Um, and I understand the boiling of the water comes from like you disinfected and things like that, but yeah. I'm just so used to the taste. Like I have to go boil water. You know, I think I boil like four liters of water a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, now my husband does it and he doesn't understand why he does it. He just boils water. So it's, it's just a habit. He but drinks I, hot water too. I mean, it's the only thing that's that's in the house, so he's gonna drink it, you know. Um, but but I'm 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 starting to drink more seltzer. I drink a lot of seltzer, um, and it is I think identity is formed through habit. A lot of a lot of it is through habit, yeah. But it would be you know you share certain tendencies, but maybe you know you live in America, so you are American, versus yeah. you live in China and you are Chinese. Yeah, yeah, no, that is very funny. And I see some of our audience, cheers to hot water completely. Yeah. And, and um, still on this on this topic, I want to explore a little bit of this Chinese identity sort of evolution in, in America. Uh, you, I, I saw on your resume that you teach um, in Philadelphia. So you, you, I'm sure you've been to that uh, Chinatown there. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. And and also the Philadelphia Art Museum. My son is um, at, studying over there, so I, I just went a couple of months ago, right? And then he's like, "I gotta have some Chinese dumplings, mom." And I said, "Yes, I'm cooking your dumplings." So I, <laughs> so, so I went to Chinatown for grocery, and it was as imagined, messy, kind of a little bit dirty, and you know, I went into a, a noodle restaurant that. Lanzhou Lamian restaurant and um, not so exciting. It's, and when you have that kind of Chinese food, somehow in my heart, I feel a little bit like the feeling of the older generation of Chinese who didn't quite have the confidence in some ways in these restaurants yeah. to sort of claim the, the cultural heritage and say, this is how Chinese food is done. And let me find a way to explain it but instead they mold into the American culture, right? Yeah. To, this is what Americans like to eat, so we serve it that way. And then I went to the art museum yeah. where they're, the biggest viewership, I would say, are these well-heeled Chinese who are very well-dressed 
and uh, they have nice clothes, nice cameras, and walking around very polite um, in the art museum. And these two are two different generations. I'm not talking about age, but they are very different. Have have you noticed the, the sort of like difference or have you thought about how this identity shifted over time? I'm just curious. And what are the driving force? If so? yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, um, I come from my parents' generation where, you know, leaving China was sort of this like quote unquote blessing. There was opportunities outside. Uh, my, my dad was born in 1960, so he lived through the Cultural Revolution, right? Like I didn't, we didn't immigrate out of China until 1995. So he lived through the Cultural Revolution. He lived through Tiananmen, like he lived through a lot of stuff. Um, so did my mother. And I think at that time it was just very tumultuous, um, but there, and there's no well. Um, but now there's more wealth, right? Um, and it's just slightly different. And when there is wealth, there is um, the great appreciation of art. And I think that's wonderful. But art does take time because you have to be not worried about your survival to appreciate art, right? Like if you're still worried about how you're gonna feed your family, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be thinking about art and literature and books, right, and beauty. Um, so I think our, our, you know, the, the Chinese immigrant generation, my generation, kids later, um, would be thinking a little bit more about kind of like what aesthetics, right? Like how can we contribute culturally to this country, America? Um, there's, you know, and how can we kind of explore sort of creativity and things like that? Um, whereas I think if you ask my father's generation, they'd be like, creativity. I don't really understand what you're trying to tell me about this, this thing, um, because my job is to provide for you. And they did. I, I had a very good, I had food, I had shelter, I had clothes, right? They, I, you know, um, and they bought me books and I, you know, I got into Harvard, right? It was like, a, I, I'm like the golden story of the immigrant child. Um, and, but it was very hard, right? So I think giving more time, you sort of see that divide. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that it is sometimes dangerous because, um, you know, I think about kind of the crazy rich Asian gener, like, you know, the crazy rich Asian book series and generation. And I admire the representation that that has provided, but I wonder if, if, if there's a way to define Asians other than through wealth right? Like we are very wealthy, but maybe it's also we are very well read or we know things about, you know, some, some of the aspects of how we can contribute like to sort of the literature, to the landscape of art, to kind of critical mm -hmm. thinking, to aesthetic thinking. Um, and I think that's what I was trying to think about with Joan and Tammy and Fong is like, Fong is very rich. He's a hedge, hedge fund banker. I know so many of those, I get it, crypto, whatever. They're like all into it. Um, and <laughs> they're making a lot of money, I get it. Um, but I think it takes three generations for people to be interested in art, right? Um, I sort of skipped ahead, but I think it, take, it does take three generations. Um, and I, you know, it, it's just a cycle of like kind of safety nets, stability and things like that. But it, it's such a difference. But in some ways I think I feel for my parents' generation, like we're almost two generations apart um, because of cultural gaps in language. Um, I think my kids would feel not that far apart from me, right? Because I would be speaking English fluently. Um, so there's a lot of other things that are kind of in, in the way. Like me and my parents sometimes feel like they're my grandparents in some ways of what they experienced, you know? Mm -hmm. um, versus like they're my parents, right? So to be honest, it's interesting. My, my grandmother has kind of a different take on it she actually reads a lot more in terms of like leisure because she just she grew up in China she was an architect she's always lived in China so I think she had this sense of kind of like a, a different approach to how things um how she kind of interacts with society very interesting yeah uh, one of our longtime um participants Anthony good to see you here uh, commented in the chat box that we talked about the, the when I said the Lanjolani and the phenomenon with ethnic food tailoring itself. To, I, didn't, I didn't know this had a name. Yeah, I didn't know either. <laughs> ethnic food tailoring. 
um, the tailoring to American taste. It's not limited to Chinese. Yes, that movie, there's a wonderful film. Uh, what's his name, the actor? Big Night. It's, it's beautiful. As another person recommended this, this film to me and I, it's a matter of survival. If the American public doesn't accept traditional ethnic food, then the restaurant closes and then these people had few other options. Yeah, but it's, it, yes. And um, there's agreement echoing of that voice there. Thank you for sharing that, Anthony. Um, yeah, but now I think this young generation, I'm seeing a lot of you know new restaurant owners who are very creative. There's a there's a noodle place like a Shanxi Noodle Place in New York that is very creative. In oh wow, uh, Shanxi Lami, I forgot what it's called, but they would ship you noodles and have YouTube videos for you to make noodles at home. So so they create they innovated to fit this cool food culture without changing the flavor of the food at all. And they're good noodles. If I find it, I'll tell you. Well, you know, it's true. Like the, I think um, the American taste palette is there's a sense of excess, like excess salt, excess cheese. Like in Italy, pizza doesn't have as much cheese as like Domino's, right? Or Pizza Hut, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and Chinese food definitely doesn't have as much salt as sometimes we put into salt here. Um, and obviously MSG has gotten a very bad reputation through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now the, the, the whole book, I adore all the characters, except there's, I'm, I have to complain to the author. <laughs> the only treatment that I did not please me, <laughs> you, oh, did not, you did not write to please me, but it, it's the, the treatment of Mark. Okay. I couldn't, I was like, oh, this poor guy, he's so nice and sweet yeah. and gentle, yeah. well-meaning soul. Yeah, I know. But yeah. you, I think, feel free to tell the story. I don't think we'd spoil much. <laughs> but So for, for maybe our readers, um, maybe I'll preface with the sense that the way that I built Mark was, um, if any of you are familiar with Seinfeld, um, I modeled Mark after Kramer. So I modeled Mark after this like kooky neighbor that moves in to Joan's empty floor. And um, I would recommend you guys Google Kramer and just like what he does. Um, but he just barges in to like Jerry's place and eats his food and like takes whatever and sort of has opinions. And Mark is very well-meaning. I'm not saying Kramer isn't well-meaning. I'm just saying Mark is sort of this like, I wanted to create him as this quintessential New York neighbor who sort of um, has a lot of opinions about what it means to be New York, what it means to be a New York neighbor, what it means to live in a co-op in New York, what it means to live on the Upper West Side. Oh my God, Seinfeld pretty much has the Upper West Side stamped. Um, and what it means to kind of be, you know, culture, right? Like you need to read the New Yorker, you need to read the New York Times, you need to read the book section, you need to read arts and literature, you need to read these books, you need to have read, I don't know, Camus or Hemingway or things like that. Um, I think doing fiction um, in my graduate program, I was I was told so much, oh, you don't, you didn't read Updike? Why, why haven't you read Updike? Um, you didn't read Cheever? Why didn't you read Cheever? Alice Monroe, you didn't read this person? Like the sense that I hadn't read so many people um, in the canon, catching up, right? I think in math, it would be like, you don't know who Pythagoras is? You don't know Pythagorean theorem? How do you not know that? Um, it, that I felt so stupid learning fiction and learning how to write. And mm. Mark is kind of an embodiment of that, that he is very well-meaning. He's very nice. He's a nice neighbor who gives her a lot of things. But ultimately, I think he is one of these people who sort of has a certain way of thinking about what it means to be American, what it means to be a New Yorker, what it means to be a New York neighbor. Mm. Um, and he is just so shocked. Joan doesn't even know Seinfeld. Like that blows his mind. Um, and I think that was an echo of my own experience when I was like talking to my husband. When I first met my husband, I was like, I've never met, I've never watched Seinfeld in my life. And he was like, you've never watched Seinfeld in your life. Like, I think I, I like ruined his day when I told him that, um, how could you not? Um, and I think the sense of cultural capital was something I was trying to echo through Mark that as a daughter of immigrants, I would never have, you know, why would, you know, I was not born in this country. I came here um, after moving around a lot. I came here when I was 12. Um, I would not have had that cultural capital. And Mark is very well-intentioned. He wants to teach her, 
but the teaching becomes almost coincided with the sense of, you know, she also knows a lot. She can save a life. She's a respiratory doctor. She knows how to operate machines. There's a lot of things he, she could teach him, but chooses not to because it's not the right place. It's not the hospital. You, a doctor would never try to teach anyone how to treat patients. Mm -hmm. um, but Mark wants to teach Joan how to be a person. And I think that's sort of the friction that they're under. And um, I, I, I get it. Like, you know, Mark was a very hard character to write me. And I, I, I understand sort of some, some of your frustration with him. <laughs> I, <laughs> no, I, just, I just felt for him. I, I know, wanna... <laughs> I know, I do. I feel for him too. I think um, it's, it's hard to sort of, it's like hard to sort of, you know, see that perspective um, mm. and, I was drawing a lot on just like my MFA experience of, I came into writing really late and I think I just didn't, you know, read a lot of writers I was supposed to have read, like Pynchon or, you know, Updike or Cheever or whatever, um, mm -hmm. in, in a certain way, like Joyce. I didn't read The Dead. How could I not have read The Dead? Um, and I'm just scrambling as a grad student trying to read all these things I was supposed mm -hmm. to read at the Western canon. Um, and, you know, it, it is one of these things that is like kind of a learning process. Mm. Well, you touched on this already. So tell us, how did you, how did you know you wanted to be a writer? And um, how did you, of doing this catch up with reading yeah. uh, English yeah. literature and, um, you know, succeeded phenomenally? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I think that's, that's a great question. Um, so I was a chemistry major at Harvard. Um, I did pretty much every single math Olympiad, science Olympiad, whatever, as a high school student. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I did, I did all of them and I won them. And so I think I got into Harvard at a perfect SAT ACT score. Um, and I got in and I was like, I'm gonna be a chem major, you know, I'm gonna be pre-med. Um, Harvard doesn't let you do a double major, so I just took all, they don't even let you do a minor. So you have to pick one major. So I picked chemistry, but I took all the um, English classes that I could. So I took old English. I wrote, I read the Canterbury Tales. I read Chaucer. I read all the Shakespeare's. I read all the Russian literatures. I read Bronte, Austin, you know, I read everyone. And I really mm. realized I love literature a lot. Um, and I think in both areas of science and medicine and, you know, writing, you think about which field you can contribute the most to and which field you really want to change or at least add to. And I, I knew I wanted, I had the skills to do both. And I think I was um, a little bit more drawn to the writing aspect, which is much harder, I understand. And I think I, you know, I'm very good at math. So I, I tried biostatistics and I was like, I could have, you know, I really could have just gone to McKinsey. Um, but I think the sense was I really wanted to do something that maybe is representative of kind of a generation of Asian Americans. Otherwise, I think this generation would get lost and I would feel a little bit sad about that. Um, mm -hmm. It would then amplify the invisibility of Asians, I think, the invisibility of my parents. My parents' generation is kind of totally invisible um, and they, they have, they're happy to be. They don't wanna be visible because then they think the government is after them, right? So um, mm -hmm. the, the sense of invisibility is so ingrained in my DNA. And being a writer is the opposite of being invisible. Um, so I, I just had this calling to that. And then when I was doing my PhD in epidemiology, um, which is kind of like massive health data processing, um, I did my MFA at BU and I so I did those two degrees concurrently. Um, oh. mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, I think, you know, as I was like, I you have to do it. And also the MFA didn't pay any money and the grad program did pay a lot of money for a stipend for, like not that much money like three thousand dollars a month okay it's not like I was, <laughs> I was making a lot of money guys I was paying <laughs> eating myself um, <laughs> and so I did them together and chemistry ended up being my thesis and Hajin who wrote this wonderful book waiting, waiting. my advisor and oh. Diaz, who wrote this wonderful book, The Friend, was also my advisor. So we had, um, they really enjoyed chemistry and then I sort of went on this route to publishing and, and being a writer. But I would say that it's very hard. Um, I would say that more times than not, I sit there and I think, 
maybe I should have just interviewed at Goldman Sachs or something. I, I don't know, you know, you think about kind of like, you know, you think about sort of like with writing, if I, if I may, if I had to calculate how much I made per hour, it would be negative $500 an hour of it. I would make <laughs> negative $500 an hour. Um, oh, I believe versus, you. <laughs> versus like if I had a, a normal quote unquote job. So there are kind of pros and cons of that. But one of the pros is I get to meet someone like you and I get to meet readers mm -hmm. and I get to kind of talk about a book. Um, and that's one of the great, you know, parts of this job. Yeah, um, I, I had to laugh and thinking just just the list of books you read through and plus chemistry. I don't know how you did that. So are you teaching literature or writing or are you teaching epidemiology right now? Um, I'm teaching writing. So at UPenn, Barnard and Columbia, I teach writing and I teach writing at the undergrad and grad level. But I do a lot of freelance tutoring and teaching. So I teach medical students for their medical exams. Um, and I guess I teach like, you know, the SAT and SC, whatever, like all the tutoring stuff. Um, okay. But I don't teach epidemiology. Um, I, I, I enjoyed my time in epidemiology. I think it was a field that I realized I didn't know if I could contribute to it in a meaningful way. And I sort of stepped back from it, but I enjoyed learning about it because it's a lot of health data. And also at the time I thought, epidemiology, infectious disease epidemiology. Who is going to get a job in infectious disease epidemiology? When are we going to have a pandemic? And this was like way before we had a pandemic. So I thought it wasn't because I took infectious disease and it was like, you know, it's like bubonic plague, right? Like Black Death, it, you know, wow. cholera. It wasn't. Wow. <laughs> You could be working for Dr. Fauci. Yeah, right I, could have, now. I could have been working for Dr. Fauci. <laughs> right. So, so the next question is a question that all Chinese mothers would ask you, right? Of course. And, so, and you so, have daughters, so I want to help your daughters. <laughs> and, and also, I think a lot of um, Chinese friends in, in our Zoom room would have the same question. So you did a PhD in epidemi epidemiology, difficult word from Harvard, and then you decide to become a writer. As we both know, I'm married to a writer, so <laughs> I know the hourly rate. Right? So, <laughs> so the, the Chinese parents would want their children always to take the safe profession, right? Lawyers, doctors, accountants, Goldman Sachs and McKinsey would be perfect choices of which I made one of them. Uh, I, I did go work, work for McKinsey. Job. It's a good so, job. Right. And um, many people will somehow find these uh, careers not suiting their souls. And yet their parents would say, you are here already, just settle, you'll have a good, mm -hmm. prosperous life. Did you encounter any of that? Um, was yeah. it a difficult choice for you? A hundred percent. I think um, one of the things was um, it wasn't just my parents. I think my peers at this point still don't understand why I write since they're like, you're clearly very competent at science and math. And why don't you just do that? And science and math can be learned. I a hundred percent agree. Science and math can be learned. And I learned it really well. And I teach it really well. And I believe in science education for girls. I believe in science literacy. I really believe in science communication because it would help a lot with, you know, in this country. Um, but I think with, with something like writing, one of the things is I, I sort of have been gifted with material in a way that, you know, material is a gift, like immigration, your parents, who you're born to, that's a gift in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I really wanna use that material in a way that respects my heritage and my lineage and my language. Um, I really like the Chinese language and I sometimes wish more people knew how like amazing this language was that was spoken by billions of people. Like it's the most spoken language in the world. And yet most of America has no idea anything about Chinese except for like what they make fun of you about in the, you know, they're like, they say ching ching chong and they make fun of you or whatever in the schoolyard. <laughs> um, and that has happened to me. Um, and so I think I really want to kind of you know, um, I'm bilingual and I'm bilingual in the sense of science and, you know, writing. And I sort of want to kind of meld those things in a way that gives a reader an enjoyable experience. But 
I understand your worry. I think one of the things that I was made very clear is that I was never going to ask my parents for money. I don't, I don't, I like do three different adjunct jobs and I tutor like 40 hours a week just to make sure that I have time to write. Um, because I unfortunately did not marry someone with a trust fund <laughs> and I did not marry a cardiologist. Um, I married, I married, um, a chemistry Another writer. I married, no, I married a chemistry professor who okay. um, teaches at like, a, you know, an undergrad college. So, mm -hmm. and I live in New York, so it's a crazy amount of expenses. Um, yeah. But I think one thing with writing is if you're gonna do it, you sort of have to do it on your own. And I respect that. I'm, I'm happy to support my own writing, but it is very hard. Like I write at 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then I work till now, right? Um, so mm -hmm. I sort of have like 14 hour days, but, um, it's really worth it because when I write, it's so centering. It's like, it's like exercising. You really kind of like learn something from the experience. Um, and I get a, I get to write a book. Um, and I think that's such a privilege already. So. Wow. Wow. Um, if, if you have the time, I would love to invite you to my Chinese, um, channel on Xiaohongshu because okay. this question I have been asked hundreds hundreds of times by, by, by parents by by both by parents and by um the children who are facing like first year second year third year college kids who are struggling and they want to talk to their parents about changing and um the the, the one point of having financial independence as a sort of minimum threshold for making your own choices is something that i think is it respects both the Chinese and the Western sort of values. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but, but you took it one step further by just trusting your talent. If, if, if writing fails, you can always become an epidemiologist. <laughs> but I, clearly... I, I think a lot of it is the fear at the beginning. I don't know how many times I was told by the people closest to me that I would fail. Um, I think, you know, your family says it to you because they they want to say the the worst things because i think the world is really hard right and they want to make sure you're prepared i was totally prepared i actually think publishing was nothing compared to like dealing with you know like my friends and my peers but um <laughs> it you have to stand on your own and i think i was never a florida i was never going to ask my parents for money i they don't have the funds for that but if I was going to write, I knew how I had to support myself. And so I do, but it's just very hard. Um, I, I don't have really that many regrets though. So I'm okay with it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, in Chinese, there's a word of 财务自由, right? Okay. Financial freedom. Uh, and I think there is a, 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 the pressure in Chinese society that puts the bar, okay. financial, financial freedom, puts the bar so high. The bar mm -hmm. means you own your house, you own your car, and uh, you can vacation in Italy. Uh, and, and a lot of young people feel like they have to grab and climb somehow to get to that bar before they can truly make their own choices. Mm -hmm. But I think in a way, the freedom you are des describing is you live your own life, right? You set your yeah. own bar. I know, and I think, um... You know, that's one thing. I'm the only child, so I feel I feel somewhat bad for my parents that they came to China, you know, they came left China, came to America, and their kid became a writer instead of like all of the other things that I could have become. But um, I hope to make them proud. I hope to do so they came here to give me an opportunity that I think they could not foresee, right? Um, and I hope that's something that's important, right? Um, that America we have a lot of problems, but I love this country for what it's been able to do for my family and also for me, but also just like the choice, I think of choosing to do something, you know, the, the, the buzzword in America is always freedom, but I think the, the buzzword that I love in this country is choice. Like I have the choice to kind of do this and then do something else. And I have the choice to just back it up, right? I can work, I can do whatever. Um, and there's this kind of like tolerance in certain ways of of managing that um but yeah you know I think sometimes my parents were really worried that I would become a writer and they would have to pay my rent but like they they haven't been able to pay for any of my expenses since I was 18 so I think they're okay 
But that was the real fear that they had, that they would have to pay for my rent while I videoed myself on TikTok or Douyin or whatever, and like <laughs> made a living for myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think your parents should be totally very proud of you already. These both these books are highly acclaimed, so they're yeah. you're doing great. Yeah, I really love it. Um, so for our audience, we don't. I've sorry, I've hoarded all the time. If anybody has any question, please, please uh, put in the chat box, and we'll get to them. And while you are thinking of a question, then. I'm going to talk about the material, the right, the material that you were talking about. A lot yeah, of I saw this comment, the Chinese parents think writing is bored. So yeah, and that's <laughs> something that my parents have actually said to me, Waiki, you don't have a real job. So thank you for saying that comment, but I've also heard it many times. <laughs> but, you know, you just, you just tell them they don't have a real job, which is true. It's true. Yeah. It's, it's not true. Bu wu literally means, you know, you're, you don't, you're, you don't not, have you're real, not doing real work. work. You're not yeah. doing real work. Or my mom would say like, you don't, like do something honest, like, you know, like, you know, do something like real, right? Like, I don't know. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know how many times I've heard that, but thank you, Wilwin, for telling me that. <laughs> it's important to understand. And uh, you're, you're doing writing. Think, imagine someone doing painting. Right, yeah. right. That would be yeah. even more Wu yeah. Um. Uh, so, so materials, I want to come back. There's a lot of like, you know, your, your upbringing that has your, you know, through the immigration, settling in different cultures and education and all of that. Fantastic. Some of the life um, that is every day that struck me very much was you talked about the mail that arrives in the mailbox and number one, Sheng Yun pamphlets, 5,000 years of history. And I just cracked up laughing because I see that all the time. Whenever the Shen Yun pamphlet shows up, I think of this absurd Chinese culture in America. And But you pick that up and then you contrasted that with the overly luxuriously produced invitation for bar mitzvah or something. Do, do you have a notebook writing down these things that um, strike you or it's just a mental note? Ooh. Hannah, Kendra, you might need to unmute Wei Ke. Um, okay, yeah. so okay. so sorry. I think I clicked a button and then I, I realized too. I was muted, and I was like, "Oh no, I can't unmute myself." But to your to your point about like traditions and and like having kind of taking notes at those events, right? Yeah. Um, sort of. Not not. I mean, I think um, I have a, generally as a, as a writer, I, I just have a pretty good memory for these things. So like when I do, when, you know, when I'm living through experiences, I sort of know I'm going to use it later on. Um, and I don't necessarily write things down. I only write things down when I'm working on a project. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't write things down when I'm not working on a project. But, um, so usually I just have a pretty good memory of things I, I want to put into, into a story like that. Yeah. Mm, interesting, because I was thinking of Peter Hessler. <laughs> he takes he rigorous. He's, he's, you know, I love his stuff. Like he's, you know, yeah. I mean, he's like, right. He's like raising kids in China. Right? He's I know, like, running marathons. Running um, marathons. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the, the, the questions are flooding in. If you want to start writing a novel, this is from Shu Ling Chen, uh, related, to, related to science, such as marine science, what advice would you give? marine science you, you said marine or, or marine like ocean okay. i think okay yeah um i think um i would recommend reading authors that you like in that field i don't know how many times i have students who just want to be published and to be read but they won't read anybody else but themselves and in some ways as a writer we are very narcissistic i understand i'm very narcissistic you know but you have to read a lot to figure out what has been said so that you can add to it. So I think if you're interested in marine biology, there's a lot of kind of ways that you can think about. It. Are there books in marine biology that you know, you're interested in that you wanna add a fiction lens to? If there's not, and you're like, I'm gonna write that first book on marine biology, I guess I'm thinking Moby Dick, right? Would be the first one I would read. <laughs> Um, and think about how we can kind of write a fiction lens to that. 
Um, but also like, what are we gonna add to that? Am I, am I bringing in basic science of marine biology into a fiction story? Am I, what am I doing with marine biology? So I think, um, you know, Toni Morrison said, if the book out there, the book that you wanna read is not out there, you have to write it, but you also have to read enough. Toni Morrison read a lot. So like if mm -hmm. the book she didn't want was not out there, it probably was not out there. So mm -hmm. ensure that the book that you want to write is not out there um, and then go for it and find a model for it. You know, for me, it was the stranger for Joan. But if there's another book, like find a model for it and go from there. Mm -hmm. I had an, an earlier question here from uh, Lei Xinya. Oh, we're going to run over time. Are you OK on time? Oh, yeah, I'm OK. Yeah, but we'll take a few questions. OK. Yeah. The, any, uh, th this is a pre previously submitted question. Any advice for young and non-professional writers on how to write their first book and find a, find a publisher? I think what you just said yes. about writing their first book, the second part, finding a publisher. Finding a publisher. Okay, so I was very lucky that um, chemistry was my MFA thesis and I found a publisher through Hodgin. He was very helpful for me. And oh. I, you know, um, so it's like this, I guess, you know, um, we respect our teachers and, you know, I, I, I do good work. Um, but finding a publisher the traditional way is you have to find an agent and then the agent sets you up with a publisher. You're not going to be able to connect with a publisher on your own. Um, you need an agent. Um, I was only able to get to my publisher because um, Hajin had sort of like a, like a connection. Um, and then I got an agent, but I would say that to really publish, you need to find an agent, which means you have to query and you have to ask people, is this book good, blah, 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 blah. And they have to be willing to work with you and represent you and then sell your book. That's how you find a publisher. Mm -hmm. Great. Jessica's question. Could you please share what's your daily life like? Let's, let's, let's run a schedule of your day. Let's oh, take daily today. Life, daily life. So today. You start writing at six. When do you today, get up? I got, I got up today. I got up at six. I did a little bit of email, wrote, I walk my dog at 7.30 to 8.30. Then I wrote a little bit more, but then I had to read. I had a 10.30 MFA meeting that went to 12. Then I had a training for a webinar that I'm doing in three weeks. Um, and then I had a tutoring session from two to four. And then I had my Chinese lesson from four to 5.30. And then I had to walk my dog and then I had to eat dinner. I had an event at 7.30 and then I'm talking to you guys now at night. Okay. <laughs> so that's my day. <laughs> it's typical, yeah? Very busy. I hats off to you. Okay, Joyce Wang has a question. Read, we read about the anti-Asian sentiments a lot. Do you feel it? You talked about some Asian medical staff having difficult feelings treating patients who blame them for the virus, for example. How are people handling that? Yeah, um, I think so. I think I had some friends who had patients not want to be cared for because they were Asian. Um, but I think, wow. you know, you leave the room, they're sedated. They're not gonna remember you, you're on call. You have to treat this patient. So you have to be there. Um, a lot of them are asked if they speak English. They only want someone who speaks English. Um, obviously they speak English. Um, and, you know, if, if, and oftentimes with the Asian women doctor, they just think that they're nurses and they're not doctors. Like the white man is the doctor, but why is the white man the doctor? I guess I think like shows like good Amsterdam, good doctor, house, Grey's Anatomy, <laughs> um, all great shows with white protagonists. Um, but they're often considered the nurse or like the nurse practitioner. They're like, I really want to see the doctor, not you. Asian women sometimes look younger. So they're like, how old are you? You know, are you really here? Or are you from like high school? You know, they get insulted about their age a lot. Um, and I think um, the sense of like, I really want to be treated by an American citizen. Are you American citizen? Who asked that question? Really, who does? But I think they get a lot of that. And that was yeah. at the height of the pandemic. That was what was happening a lot, that they were just kind of getting questioned about their authority. And I think yeah. that was um, kind of stressful for them. Okay, wow. We have two last questions and we won't sure. take any new questions. Um, okay. So uh, this is from here. So many of these uh, themes resonate with me and other children of Im or immigrants. My uncle Sammy used to say, when are you gonna get a lunch pail and get a real job? <laughs> I think that's a comment. 
Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And um, here's from Amber Tao. I came to the U.S. from Chongqing at 16 and now 25. I never thought about staying in the U.S., but for some reason I'm still here. And I admit that I learned so much and achieved so much here. But I realized the longer I stay in the U.S., the more I don't belong to my home in China. I feel a little worried, lost, but excited at the same time. Weiko, can you share with us your definition of home? And by the way, all my family uh, in Chongqing. So I felt my home is still in Chongqing, but I spent almost half of my life in the U.S. already. Oh, I understand that. You know, it's interesting. Um, I was born in China. I learned English. I went to elementary school in Australia, Canada. I came to the United States. My dad was in Brazil for a while doing his like studies. So we were like a very split up family. I think for a while, home was where my parents were. Um, and right now that's not where I live, but I think home is a very different thing now. Home is where you feel the most comfortable. Home is where you feel safe. Though occasionally I don't always feel safe in New York, but I think I feel a loyalty towards the city that I don't feel, I haven't felt in other cities. So, um, and I feel a sense of control here. Like, you know, New York was where I first published with The New Yorker um, and uh, chemistry did really well. And I wrote my second book um New York was where I got married like New York was where I found an apartment you know and I think home is sort of where you kind of become an adult really um and so New York is that place for me right now and I'm sure that will change but I think here was where I really gained a lot of confidence um and gained a lot of sense of myself um and also just you know just figuring out your career right that's like the big part um it is very hard um I would say that I think about I think about it a lot. Once my parents go, where is home for me? I will be the only living family from my family line. Like my dad's entire side is in China. My mom's entire side is in China. Um, it's just my parents and me here. It's three people, um, and so I I do think about it, that a lot. But I think home is a choice, um, and that's one of the great things about this country is you can choose where you want to live, and you can choose where you want to make a home, and you can choose your partner, you can choose your family, you can choose your friends. Um, and it, it, that is very contrary to the Chinese mindset of blood is, is it, right? Lineage is it. Um, it's just a kind of a different thing. But I, I get a sense of, I do understand the alienation. Um, and I think it just, it's inevitable. You let it happen um, because you gain so much else. You lose some, you gain some. It, it's sort of a balancing act. So beautifully said. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm okay. yeah. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thanks for taking the time to chat with. Of Any course. last um, parting words of wisdom you want to share with us? No, mate. I think I feel like you have more wisdom than I do. I mean, you, you've done it all, and you have three kids. Amazing. <laughs> I actually am a huge admirer of how you do it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, think, I think you need to write a book, man, and then you can kind of teach us how it's done. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I need to read all the books. I start from there, like, like, which I love. I love reading. So, uh, okay. Then last bit then. Thank you all for taking the time. You can find Wei Ke on Instagram. It's Wei Ke Wang, all connected in one word. And you can find a picture of Biscuit. Yeah, you can find a picture of me. Um, wakeuponwrites.com slash dog. <laughs> That's where you can stay connected with Waker's future books, etc. So thank you. And two little things before we go. One is we do have a podcast called the China Travel Podcast. And the latest episode was a conversation with the CEO of UCCA, Philip Tinari in Beijing. Mm. I enjoyed that conversation tremendously. So do give it a listen. Any of the platform and uh, anyone welcome and our next book talking about the language actually we could you might want to come to that one we're yeah, reading, I, would love to. I would love to yeah we're reading kingdom of characters i, I um, saw that i that's on my list i'm happy to read it, it, it you would find these two books connect really well because they are about characters and the evolution but she explores this from a different angle more like historical angle and that's sometime in May. Information's on our website. Do go there and sign up. So uh, yeah, I hope to see you there. Okay. Thanks again. Thanks, Wei Kun. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you, May. See you, Okay. See you. And thanks, Andrew, and the Well China team. Bye-bye. <laughs>